Good afternoon, everyone. This is T3 Live Editor-in-Chief John Darcy here to bring you the daily recap. I'm excited to welcome a new guest on the show today, Dan Darrow. Uh, he's a great young trader we added to the VTF. A few months ago, back in June, we provide a little bit different perspective on uh, trading. He trades a little bit more options. He trades a little bit more cash flow around news catalysts and options. So, Dan, welcome to the show. Um, Dan, first, before we get into stocks and start talking stocks, how about you uh, tell us a little bit more about your career and your evolution as a trader. So, John, I, I began trading about seven and a half years ago. Um, and when I first started, I was a very equities-based trader. Um, to, be, to be completely honest, I didn't even trade options. It wasn't even a glint on the radar at that point. Um, and what I found was is that uh, equities are very good for cash flow, but not so good for taking longer-term positions because you can't necessarily manage your risk overnight. And I always felt like I was missing out because a lot of the, this market is the moves happen overnight. There, there's gaps. You hear a lot moves. of griping on the trading floor about guys missing yeah. overnight moves and things like that. Yeah. So I got to the point where I, I thought that, you know, there has to be some way to capitalize. And I, I viewed options as a perfect way because I knew that I could manage my risk by knowing exactly what I'm risking at any given point. And I would be able to capitalize on these moves that have been taking place overnight. So very gradually, I moved from a strictly equities trader to what would probably be now more predominantly options trader. Yeah, I mean, just looking at your positions right now on the virtual trading floor, for example, I see that you traded some equities intraday today, but you still have 20 or so options positions that you're long overnight. Yeah, well, it, I, I do like to trade equities when markets are moving. So during earnings season, I'll, I'll trade quite a bit of equities. But uh, when it's slower and when... You know, the action has been taking place, a lot of it overnight. I do like to focus mainly on options. Okay. Uh, so the topic of your webinar, we're hosting a webinar this Thursday. Dan is hosting the webinar. It's uh, titled, How to Trade Options Around Earnings. So that's what we're going to focus on a little bit here in this daily recap. I'll give you a little preview of what that's going to be like. And today we posted an article on the homepage of T3 Live uh, talking a little bit more about what factors Dan likes to consider when he's game planning an options trade. So, Dan, will you go a little bit more... Uh, in depth about what some of those factors are that, that you look at when you're planning an options trade or looking for a potential options trade? Yeah, of course. So uh, what I talked about a little bit today in the article was uh, what I think is, is very important is to know your, your market cycle. So right now we're in, I've been in a pretty strong bull market and I think it's important to realize this because uh, companies that have missed have not necessarily been punished and companies that have beaten are the ones that are having significant moves higher. So I feel like it's it's better strategy right now to be a predominantly call buyer in a bull market. It's sort of like you know, IPOs in a bull market. Most companies look to IPO when the market is strong because they're going to get some residual impact from that. It's sort of like what you were describing, and we were talking about that today for your article, uh, is that, like you said, in bull markets, uh, you get a lot of follow-through to the upside. You get short squeezes, things like mm -hmm. that. And in, in a bull market, the downside moves are a little bit muted. So that means you're a little bit more of a call buyer over the last year, two years? Yeah. Exactly. I, I would say that I'm, I'm very bullish. Uh, obviously, this pays a lot better when the market's strong. But uh, one of the main things that I have been looking at is and been focusing on is companies that have very high short interest. So uh, in and of themselves, like a company with high short interest won't tell you anything. But, you know, a stock that's in a bullish formation with high short interest could be something to pay attention to because these have been the patterns lately that have really been paying well. Short interest is a very interesting case to me because a lot of people say shorts are the smartest money in the market, that you know, people who are willing to take short positions, they're the ones that are the most sophisticated types of investors. But so often this year, we've seen these huge short squeezes in stocks that have a high short interest. So I feel like you know, short interest, if, any, if nothing else, is sort of fuel, at least short-term fuel for stocks. Is that the way you perceive it? It sort of just exaggerates moves? Yeah, I completely agree. And, and it's not necessarily that these people are wrong. It just could be, you know, for whatever reason, it's just bad timing. And in a strong market, if you get caught with too large of a short position, I mean, you're going to have to scramble to cover. And, I mean, whether or not the stock over the course of, you know, a few months trades back down, it's just like for like these temporary short moves, I mean, short interest really does throw fuel like, on a fire that has already been burning. Another thing we wrote about in the article today was uh, how you price it or you look at recent uh, earnings moves. So you look at um, how much a stock moved percentage wise into the most recent or after the most recent earnings report. But a lot of people come back and say, well, that's going to be priced into the option this time around. So obviously the key for you is going to be identifying stocks that are going to move more than 
uh, Wall Street and investors expect. How would you answer that question? How do you find stocks that might move, that might be expected to have a 10% move? How do you identify stocks that might move even more than that? Well, it's a combination of, of the, the, the handful of things I listed in, in the article. And I mean, really what it is, it's a, it's a good deal of technical analysis. So you combine all the elements and then you look at the chart and a stock that is setting up um, maybe like what I was talking about in the article today, like that's setting up like 5% away from all time high and it, it's pricing in about a 5% move, but then you look at the chart and you realize that a 5% move, 5 to 6% move will put into all time highs. Add on the short interest and you know, a 5 or 6% move through all time highs with short interest in a strong market and that's when you get a 10% move when only 5% is priced in. So you're looking for that perfect storm, that perfect setup of multiple factors sort of mm -hmm. aligning rather than just you know, seeing a stock with heavy short interest and just buying it at three o'clock looking for a big earnings move. Exactly, so it's the combination of a stock that has a history of gaps, uh, a technical setup that, that looks good, and also, you know, the other factors. So, you know, a strong market and short interest and things of that nature that I would combine all of them and then when you add in the technical analysis, that's what really, that's what really determines whether or not a stock could really make a large move. Okay, and the, the last element of this that I want to talk about is execution. You know, you can talk about all these hypotheticals, but it really comes down to executing these trades. Uh, like I said before, are you buying these stocks at 3 o'clock uh, right before the earnings report sort of on a whim, uh, even if it's not on a whim, looking for just that earnings gap, or are you uh, days prior to the report working into a position, or how do you execute these trades, or does it vary? Uh, it definitely varies, and uh, what I like to talk to, to people about on the VTF is that uh, I mean, there's, there are instances where I will wait just until like the last few minutes of the day if, mm -hmm. if I think a stock has been pretty volatile and, you know, I want to make sure I get like a, a good price. Or there's instances also where I'd like to buy like early in the week and sell the premium. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I, if I think it's going to be a, a hotly purchased option into, into the number, then I may look to benefit from that by purchasing it early and, and maybe, you know, if I bought more than a few, then I could sell a couple earn that premium then hold on to what I have at a discounted price. So it's sort of like if it's a, if it's a really hyped earnings report, everybody expects the Apple 9S to come out and have this huge yeah. earnings number and everybody's sort of buying the stop, stock up into the earnings report, you're looking to buy in and get some of that uh, benefit from that hype rather than actually playing the report. Exactly. So when the contract first comes out, it will obviously have the premium built in for the report, mm -hmm. but then once you add in the people that are going to be speculating on it and the purchasers, it's going to that the cost of that contract is going to go up. So as opposed to wait until the day of when you know everyone's going to be purchasing, I could possibly purchase it earlier in the week and then sell into that that move when everyone's bidding them up. And this is all sort of based on feel. You know, we talked in the article about how it's more of an art than a science. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wish I could get into like specifics and say in certain in, in certain uh, situations that I, I would do it, but it really it's it's a it's a, it's a feel. So you know, you have like the the heavily followed stocks, um, which I would say are probably better examples of uh, situations where you could do that. So it's like the Facebook, the Apple, the Google um, stocks that you know everyone's going to be focusing on. Uh, those could be scenarios that play out like that. Uh, but there's also there's also other ones that fly under the radar that, that most people don't follow that also could be situations like that. So it, it is kind of, there, there's not really an exact science to it. It's kind of like a feel uh, for me. Um, and uh, I don't mean, know, it, it, it goes by earnings season. So it, like one, something that works for one earnings season may not be the exact same for the next. All right, well, let's dive a little bit into some recent market action and give you a few examples of stocks that uh, Dan is playing right now prior to earnings report, maybe a few to keep on the radar for earnings report. The market today was able to bounce. We got the government shut down, uh, and it was sort of a buy the news type situation where everybody says, all right, enough of this uh, you know, posturing. We finally got the shutdown, and now we seem to focus on the debt ceiling in a couple weeks. But in the meantime, it uh, looks like a little bit of pressure got relieved from the market. In terms of your trading, Dan, how much do you factor in these short-term gyrations in the market? Are you speculating on short-term moves in the S&P, for example? Uh, I, I speculate on short-term moves, but uh, from a technical perspective. So uh, these headlines, I, I believe, are they can influence the market a little bit, but I think that uh, more often than not, um, you know, a technical pattern has been developing, and then headlines could just be a, a reason that uh, people explain the move and not necessarily a cause for the move.
Yeah, the media is always trying to slap a headline on a reason for a bounce or a reason for a, a down move, and sometimes it's just the, the product of technicals. So we were down, uh, I believe, seven of the last eight days. Uh, so we were due for a bounce, and you know whether or not whether or not there was a, fund a fundamental reason for it, uh, the technicals were kind of showing it. We were a little bit overextended on the short term to the downside. Um, we popped above. 50-day moving average, and we got a little bit of a bounce once we did that. All right. Uh, one stock position that I've – actually, it's an options position that I noticed on your VTF. That's one that we've been talking about some in our off-the-charts newsletter and morning calls and things like that is FSLR. It's a very uh, highly followed solar stock, as you all probably know. Uh, what have you been looking for in FSLR? We can just go to the chart and take a look at the chart, and you can talk about it as we uh, look at the visual. So First Solar uh, obviously had a, a very negative move from its last earnings report back in, uh, I believe that was Early August. Early August, yeah. yeah. Look at the chart now. So it had a very, very large move to the downside, and it's been trying to form a base. And just in the last few weeks in September, um, you can see it's been kind of consolidating underneath the 200-day moving average. Um, and it's just been just an increasing base. Uh, it's been wedging into the $40 level, and last week it broke above, uh, couldn't really hold, and then this week it came back above, and once it took out the 50-day moving average, you saw the volume today, That's the volume kicked in, and it confirmed the breakout of the 50-day, and, and right now it, it seems that there isn't a whole lot. Volume on here. Yeah, it seems that there isn't a whole lot up until the 45 level. So I'd be looking for some continuation over the next few days. So when you look at gaps like this, so say, uh, First Solar was reporting earnings tomorrow. Is this one that you would say, all right, it's a little bit beaten down, still has a heavy short interest, and in you're looking for a gap fill potentially and then acceleration beyond that, or what would you look for in FSLR? Exactly. So um, it, it would be a scenario that you, you if, if you were going to be betting on the bullish side, that you would be expecting a gap fill uh, just because it's been such a large gap and it's very clearly into the gap at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it could also be something that if you were thinking uh, negatively, that, uh, you know, if it took out the, the short-term support at right around 36, that there's a little bit more room to the downside. Uh, and it's, you know, it could be one where you could play either way. You know, it would have to be something that uh, you decided the day of. Mm -hmm. and it could be a situation where I played like a strangle type move. All right. Another uh, position I noticed on your virtual trading floor today that we wanted to talk about was GPOR. Had a nice breakout out of an upper level base today. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for in a trade like this that's not part of earnings season? Okay, so um, the domestic oil names, the energy names, have actually been pretty strong lately. And um, let's go to the chart over here. And this, this is one that kind of flies under the radar. You have um, the one that a few people follow, like uh, the Pioneer, the PXD, the EOG. Uh, this one's a little bit different. Uh, it's kind of it's got some heavy short interest. And in September, it's formed a nice base above 60. Uh, it's got some support at the 20-day moving average. And uh, today was the, the first breakout of the 65 level. It confirmed, uh, had decent volume, and uh, I'm thinking that it has some more room to run coming from a nice base at that 60 area with the, the short interest to help propel it a little bit higher. Yeah, definitely, uh, you see a really strong uptrend here on the monthly chart, so it looks like some po uh, possible continuation here on a daily time frame. Mm -hmm. Another position that uh, we want to talk about was SNTS. Santeros, yeah. Santeris. So this is a this was a hot biotech so far this year. Uh, it, it's had a like strong I mean, sector biotech. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a it was I mean even by biotech uh, standards it was having a pretty outstanding year up until the beginning of August. Uh, then it, it got kind of into like a, some profit taking. Um, and then it you know kept coming in a little bit further. It took out some key support at the at the 50 day moving average and it, it took a little bit of a hit on it. And now it's been consolidated underneath, but I think that it's it's finally uh, broken the downtrend, and I think uh, that the bio sector remains strong. And I think that this is this could be one that some money comes back into, and plays catch up with the with the rest of the sector. Yeah, I mean a basic factor with options is premium. So you obviously don't want to pay high premiums for options if you can. You don't like to chase big mm -hmm. up moves and buy calls after a st uh, stock is already ignited. Does that attract you to a stock like this S and T S chart that? is a little bit beaten down, uh, premiums obviously are going to be lower and people aren't expecting really a bounce. Is that one that attracts you if it starts to, to edge above sort of a downtrend, uh, you know, downtrend line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is definitely a, a stock that uh, is not as widely followed as some. 
and it's a cheaper stock, but it also moves quite a bit. So uh, it's a nice combination of uh, value in terms of the option not costing too much and the ability to actually pay pretty well because I think that it, it um, in terms of a cheaper stock, it actually does move quite a bit. In general, do you like to focus on some of those off the radar type names or do you like to, you know, focus also on Apple, Google, the Teslas of the world? Or you, do you like to do a mixture or do you focus on one or the other? Uh, I would say predominantly I, I don't focus on the, the widely followed ones. There, there's scenarios where I, I think if, if, you know, a high beta, closely f uh, widely followed stock it was setting up that I'd, I'd like to be in it. But generally speaking, I like to follow the things that kind of fly a little bit under the radar. Um, I feel like I can get a better value with some of the options because the, the premiums aren't bid up as much. Uh, and also because there's a ton of stocks, so mm -hmm. you don't necessarily always need to focus on the few that everyone talks about. I mean, there's plenty of good setups out there, not just ones in Netflix, Apple, and Google. Yeah, we talked about the media, media obsession with certain stocks, and definitely, I feel like sometimes leads a lot of people astray. They always want to focus on the names that are in the media. A lot of times there's a lot better opportunities in names that aren't uh, on the beaten path, so uh, interesting to hear from you. And that'll wrap up today's daily recap. I want to remind you about Thursday's webinar with Dan. Uh, should be an outstanding webinar. He's been uh, very well received in the VTF since we added him there in June. Uh, the subscribers have found him uh, very educational and definitely brings a little bit different perspective than some of the other guys that we have in the VTF and in our community. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, if you register for the webinar, we'll also send you the recording. So if you can't be there live Thursday at 4.30, don't worry about it. We'll send you the recording. Uh, but thanks, Dan, for joining me. This has been John Darcy, your editor-in-chief here for The Daily Recap. Uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow morning for The Morning Call.